Dirty Harry, but as a New Orleans detective with sexual hang-ups chasing a woman killer in Tightrope, one of four new movies we'll be reviewing this week on At The Movies, the movie review program. Across the aisle for me, Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And across the aisle for me is Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. Now, in addition to the new Eastwood movie, we're also going to be reviewing the controversial box office hit Red Dawn and the new comedy The Woman in Red. And we'll also do an x-ray segment on the so-called new patriotism in movies. But first, Gene's going to start with Revenge of the Nerds. Revenge of the Nerds. That's a wonderful title for a movie, a wonderful idea for a movie, The Underdog Strike Back. And best of all, the film itself is quite funny, telling sort of an Animal House college comedy, not with the slobs beating up on the cool guys this time. No, it's the nerds, the twerps, the funny-looking shy guys who do the damage. And in this scene, the nerds try to take their revenge against the fraternity of cool guys by staging a panty raid on the cool guy's favorite sorority. Their action tonight? demands an immediate retaliation. And if we don't, we're nothing but the nerds they say we are. I know what we're going to do. <gasps> Penny Raid! I love that line, some nerd saw me naked. The worst <laughs> thing that could possibly happen. That scene with the Mission Impossible music may make Revenge of the Nerds seem like just another college campus comedy, and there are those elements in the film. But what makes it special are the characterizations by Robert Carradine and Anthony Edwards as those two lead nerds we saw. <laughs> they are actually sweet guys, their characters, gentle guys, and we root for them, for the meek, to inherit the cool guy's turf. So, for all of the standard gross-out hijinks that are in the picture, Revenge of the Nerds works, I think, best when it gently delivers the message that nerds are people, too. You know, that's funny. That's exactly what I thought about the movie, and I didn't know what your opinion was no. until I just heard you saying it. No. It is a sweet movie. It is a gentle movie, despite the fact that it also has the panty raid scene right. and the Animal House stuff and right. the gross guys and the belching contest yeah. and the Porky's ripoff and the yeah. shower scenes and all of those things that we've grown so tired of and so down on. At right. the same time, there's a human element underlying this film that makes it interesting, the story of these, of these nerds. Yeah. And you know, the, uh, it's, the, it's sweet. It's yeah, funny. The, other, the original title, I think, comes out of a magazine article about all these guys who were, you know, the science wizards in your class with mm -hmm. four eyes mm -hmm. who now are running the Silicon Valley. You're telling Valley. me about the guys with four yeah, eyes, right? But, you know, the guys who were running all the Silicon Valley uh, computer uh -huh. Uh, uh -huh. Uh, firms and making millions of dollars. But this is just about <laughs> wimps, you know, just about guys that are a little unsure of uh -huh. themselves. And they're very nice toward each other. They support each mm -hmm. other. And... It's a cute I movie. I think my favorite part was when the nerd got the blonde. I like that. Part. Oh, okay. Next at the movie is another nerd. This one is played by Gene Wilder, and he falls in love with a woman in red. The woman in red, and it stars Gene Wilder as an absolutely ordinary office worker. Uh, in other words, just a nerd, or I guess a middle-aged nerd would be a wimp. 
until one day his nerddom comes to an end when he's in the parking garage of the building where he works and he sees a beautiful girl in a red dress who walks across a ventilation grate as we just saw a moment ago and it blows her skirt up over her head just like that famous Marilyn Monroe scene. Well, Wilder falls instantly in love with this woman and the movie is about all of the idiotic calamities that happen to him while he tries to lie to his wife, deceive his friends, and get a date with this mysterious woman. Finally, in this scene, his wildest dreams come true. model Kelly LeBrock in her film debut there and the problem with that scene is that although she explains to Gene Wilder that he has become totally irresistible to her we don't know why that is because mm -hmm. the only scene where the two of them talk to each other is a scene that's much earlier in the film where he cuts away remember into a long shot and yeah. you never hear what they say so the fact yeah. is that the problem with this movie is basically that Wilder is going to bed with a complete stranger not only to him but also to us in the audience we never understand what that chemistry is there was never a moment when he gets to know the woman and read as a person and she's only an excuse for a whole series of lame gags involving Wilder's male friends now all of his mm -hmm. friends have secrets and all of their secrets lead up to excruciatingly sincere scenes in which everybody learns to forgive and understand and love each other and hug each other until you want to puke and meanwhile <laughs> what about the woman in red what about about her what about their relationship this movie wanders all over the map it bounces back and forth between slapstick and corny cliches and I can forgive all of those things but it's also not funny and I'll give you some more because you've knocked the comedy you've knocked the relationship and you've knocked the men and those were a lot of lousy characters and the they are very unpleasant guys for all of their tenderness at the end mm -hmm. they're, they're not you not don't want to nice be around guys. no you don't want to be around them the women in this film, other than Kelly LeBrock, who is a great-looking woman, and you can understand why he's interested in her, but the other women, Gilda Radner is, this, mm -hmm. is in this film. Now, everyone, total know, waste. Now, now everyone knows that, that, that Wilder and Radner have a relationship off-camera, okay? So you're expecting her to have a big role, you know, and she's a great comedian. I have, she looked like a ghost in this picture. She looked horrible. She does nothing funny. Then and, Judith and, Ivy and, and and she disappears okay. two thirds of the way right. through the picture, Fine. and you never hear another word about it. And her. Judith Ivy, who plays yeah. his wife, she's an uh -huh. exciting actress. That's right. Big hit on Broadway in uh -huh. Hurley Burley. Okay. Uh -huh. In this movie, she looks like a jerk in this film. Uh -huh. This film is amazing. There is not one attractive character other than the woman in red. And furthermore, there's no energy bringing the film from beginning to end because everything seems to be... There, many times in the film, it looked to me as if people were just standing around waiting for something to happen. There wasn't a, a story okay. that really unfolded because every time you got involved in a character, they cut away from that character and give you a whole lot of information about somebody else mm. you don't care about at all. They didn't cut away. The director, Gene Wilder, did. He mm. can't direct movies, I'm afraid. Red Dawn is our next film, and like Revenge of the Nerds, that is a terrific idea for a movie. When you hear this idea in Red Dawn, you immediately want to see the picture, or at least have someone tell you how it turns out. Red Dawn is about World War III being fought on American soil when Russian and Cuban paratroopers land in a Colorado town. Now here's the terrific opening scene of the movie, set in a high school history class. Well now, my friend. Well now. Oh, check it out. All right. You look pretty cool, though, man. I would say they were way off course. This is very unusual. You do something, Mr. Teasdale.
no theoretical history lesson anymore. This is reality, and that is a shocking opening scene. Now, who's going to fight the commies? That's where Red Dawn comes up with another new twist. Who fights on screen? Not the U.S. Army. Oh, they help in the background. But the main fighters in Red Dawn are those same teenagers who organize themselves into a guerrilla hit-and-run fighting unit called the Wolverines after their high school football team. Here they spy on the communist takeover of their town. That's the mayor's car. They got Daryl's dad's car. Look at the size of that tank. Jesus. Lewis. Lewis. How you doing? Was he scared of us? They don't understand. They know who all of you are. They're looking for you. Who? The KGB. Or the Russians? And Cubans. Cubans. Look, have, have, have you seen my father? I, I, I called, there was no answer. I went by the station, it was empty. I'm going to tell you something I'm not supposed to talk about. Nobody is. But... But what? But they took a lot of people away. People that they thought were going to make trouble for them. People that had guns or things they wanted, they just took them away. Where? Re-education camps, that's what they call it. The drive-in. I heard they took a lot of people to... Jed! Pray for you. That's another good scene. Some nice restrained music there. Normally most music in movies is overblown. Not there. That's good. Red Dawn is terrific in setting up its premise. And it's also very clever movie marketing in this picture to have the teenagers doing the fighting. Teenagers being the most frequent moviegoers. We've had teenage gangster pictures, teenage musicals, teenage comedies. Now Red Dawn, the first teenage war film. The next teenage western is the next, I guess. But uh, the film does not maintain its great beginning. It becomes involved in all sorts of macho training exercises and an investigation in the mind of a Cuban freedom fighter and whether right-wing totalitarianism is the same as left-wing totalitarianism. So as much as I enjoyed, say, the first hour of Red Dawn, the film just peters out at the end. A mixed review for me. A real negative review for me, Gene. I think this movie is corrupt from beginning to end. And one of the problems I have with it is that it makes a very definite political statement. In other mm -hmm. words, people should have handguns. They shouldn't be registered. The commies will come in and get the handguns. And then what do the teenagers use? Machine guns and anti-tank missiles. Well, that's mm -hmm. terrific. Maybe we should have those, too. There is a whole right-wing ideology in this yes. picture that the picture itself doesn't deserve because it doesn't make its arguments with any kind of attention to logic. There is nothing in this well, movie... There was not a scene in this movie that doesn't have the gravest logical flaws in it, starting with the possibility that America would be invaded by paratroopers. I doubt it. I think if we're invaded at all, it would probably uh, be a Roger, nuclear war. I, Everybody would be I'm, dead, and that'll be the, that. The, but okay, but give the film at least the beginning of its premise. Okay, I'll give it its premise. I'll okay. give it the premise. We're right. invaded. Okay. Then I'll give it the next idea. Yeah. Teenagers are going to fight the Russians. How come these teenagers yeah. are so smart that the Russians and Cubans are constantly doing nothing more than standing there and being blown up? I believe it would be more interesting to the teenagers had done things like yeah. steal their gasoline uh, or let the okay, air out of their tire let me tell instead you, of using anti-tank missiles against their movie, compound. This movie, you and I both know that this movie is not about how teenagers would beat the it's Russians. A total, no, it's a total no, wait a fantasy minute. pandering to teenagers. That's right. Yes. Like okay. most movies that pander to teenagers, and most okay. movies pander to anybody. Yeah. And this movie is saying, hey kids, here's, you know, forget your little, you know, uh, love everybody in the world. Someday the Russians are going to come here. Now, you may not believe that. I may not believe that. But this movie wants to play to that. And I think it's, mm -hmm. it is so fascinating about what it would be like if that I was but fascinated for a while. It isn't what it would be like if. Because I would not like to see a movie in which realistic, convincing, plausible teenagers yes. in this situation behave the way 15 and 16-year-old kids okay. might and you know behave. Okay, and you know what it would be, they Roger? They know how they behave in this movie. No. They behave like John Wayne no. would behave. No, no. Because your movie, the reality would mean a short subject. They'd be blown away. 15 minutes. Well, then maybe that might be a good movie, and we wouldn't have to sit through this one. Next at the movies, we're going to have, in a little bit, an x-ray section where we're going to talk about these new patriotic movies yeah. a little bit more in detail. But next, Clint Eastwood, in his new movie, plays the kind of cop that even Dirty Harry, I think, would despise. That's next. What else were you wondering? What it would be like to lick the sweat. This new thriller is named Tightrope, and it's another one of Eastwood's violent police movies, only half a year after Sudden Impact, his big hit about uh, Dirty Harry's latest adventures. 
But the cop that Eastwood plays in Tightrope is a lot different from Harry Callahan. He's a homicide detective in New Orleans, a kinky cop who likes to spend his spare time tying up prostitutes and handcuffing them to the bed. Then the cop is assigned to a messy case. A mad slasher is killing hookers in the French Quarter, and Eastwood, as a cop, has to go back to some of the same places he's already been as a customer. being punished by a strong man. Um, he said uh, you'd want this. What for? Me. He's wrong. He said you were just like him. Who's he? Use the whip. You're, uh, you're to wear this to Praline's. I don't know who he is. I don't think Dirty Harry would have <laughs> let her get very far with that kind of behavior. You can get a little hint there of the tricky situation the Eastwood character is in in this movie because the more he investigates those murders, the more the evidence seems to suggest that maybe he ought to be one of the suspects himself. Eastwood, who feels so threatened by women that he likes to handcuff them, meets a feminist, though, in this movie, the director of a rape prevention center played by Javier Bujold, and they're immediately attracted to one another, but at first, Eastwood tries to treat her like his other women, and that won't work. Tightrope combines the murder investigation with the development of that relationship between Eastwood and Bujold, a relationship that depends on Eastwood learning to trust a woman and to be willing to depend on her. What's surprising about this movie is that it really turns out to be about a man learning to be able to love a woman. Tightrope is a deeper and better movie than it might at first seem to be. Oh, I agree. I think it's very good, mm -hmm. too. And, you know, on a thriller level, we'll talk about that first. On a thriller level, this film does what I have been asking Eastwood to do with the Dirty Harry movies, which is, number one, give himself a strong villain. That's right. The guy in this film is a real creep, and you want him silenced. Eastwood, anybody, get rid of this guy. Mm -hmm. Number two, he's got even a stronger woman to play against mm -hmm. than some of the Dirty Harry mm -hmm. pictures. John Vee Bouchard is one of our best actresses, and I think she's great in this film. Beyond that, mm -hmm. Eastwood, now on the theoretical level, Eastwood does a terrific job risking his star charisma. Mm -hmm. All stars want to be liked. Mm -hmm. They rarely play bad guys. He plays a louse. Mm -hmm. And we watch this in fascination, and then he's t we take, or take it inside uh -huh. of him, and we do think about what it is really like to abuse women, and you don't get that much in the movie. Well, I agree with those points. Uh, I'll move on to another point I liked about the movie, and that is the photography mm -hmm. in the city of New Orleans, the film noir look of this film, right. the night the shadows, the mm -hmm. mystery, the, the wet uh, streets that are empty yeah. in the hours before dawn. This is a terrific looking movie and it's mm -hmm. so hard sometimes mm -hmm. to make a stylistic movie that still moves yeah. that uh, they've shown us there how to do it. There is one here. problem, one oh, major, yeah. major flaw in the story and I'm amazed. He should realize since the guy is going after and killing the women he's just been with, in his investigation, elementary detective work would tell you that the guy has to have a grudge on him and he doesn't figure that out until late in the movie and that bothered me. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I think it's a terrific film. Come in next to the movies, our x-ray segment on the latest political trend in American movies, the new super patriotism. Things are different now. <laughs> our x-ray subject this week, Red Dawn and the new conservative super patriotism that's popping up in American movies. You know, years ago in the 1960s, with pictures like The Graduate and Easy Rider, Hollywood was wearing its politics on its sleeve, and those politics were decidedly left-wing and anti-establishment. Recently, however, the times have been a-changing, and we are seeing more and more films that support the establishment and embrace the military. Two films in the past two years fit this bill, and both were surprise smash hits. In First Blood, with Sylvester Stallone, a Vietnam veteran turned himself into a one-man assault team and presented a sad but heroic portrait of the American fighting man. A year later, in Uncommon Valor, another Vietnam vet, a former colonel played by Gene Hackman, 
put together a dirty half dozen assault team to fly to Laos to bring back American soldiers still missing in action from the Vietnam War. Both films presented heroic portraits of the American fighting man, and that certainly was new to American movies in the last 20 years. Now comes Red Dawn, which for all of its love of combat might as well be a military training film for our nation's youth. Don't be a wimp, this film is saying. The Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, and only the strong will survive. Leaving aside the quality of these movies, that is a new message from Hollywood, and given the political orientation of this country with Ronald Reagan as president, I think the new conservatism of American movies is yet another example of how the movies always reflect back to us what has been going on in life. It's not the other way around. They always come back to us. In other words, you're saying that Hollywood doesn't say, okay, we ought to be conservative, so we'll make these movies. Hollywood is saying we pick this up from our audience surveys or from our feedback or from our instincts, and that's why we make these films. Don't you agree? Could be. In other words, it's a mirror. A mirror, society. definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this program. We both like Revenge of the Nerds, sort of a sweeter version of Animal House. Two thumbs down, though, for Gene Wilder's The Woman in Red, a movie that was about almost everything except The Woman in Red. And the split decision on Red Dawn, the U.S. evasion movie. Gene admired its energy and premise. I thought it turned into a routine and unbelievable war movie. And two thumbs up for Tightrope, Clint Eastwood's intelligent, sensitive, and very violent new thriller. And it is... A pretty rough R rating on that one, we ought to add. Absolutely. Yeah. That's it for this week. Next time, we'll have reviews of more new movies, including a science fiction adventure comedy called Buckaroo Banzai, as well as the jungle adventure Sheena, starring Tanya Roberts as Queen of the Jungle. <laughs> Until then, we'll see you at the movies. Pan American, whether it's business or pleasure or a little bit of both across the country and around the world, Pan Am, you can't beat the experience. America's favorite movie candies are coming home. Now enjoy Razomets, Goobers, and Snow Caps at home and at the movies, star attractions for your movie time pleasure. New AutoFresh flow-through car air freshener attaches to your air vent and circulates freshness throughout your car. Another fresh new idea from Johnson Wax.